Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sustainability and the Path to Equity. Very glad to have you all join our panelists and myself virtually today, and I hope you are, all are staying well and healthy. I'm Peter Fadul, and I help manage the Sustainability and Circular Economy Program here at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. The impetus for this webinar was that the sweeping public outcry for social justice and equality of opportunity, which has been magnified over the events of the past few months, has given rise to a closer examination of how equity can be better achieved in all facets of society. And the environmental spaces is certainly no exception. Communities of color and underserved communities in general have long been disproportionately affected by environmental injustices, including higher air pollution rates, relative energy costs, chemical exposure, and poor food and, and water quality, among other things. For instance, according to the NAACP's Environmental and Climate Justice Program, about 70% of black communities are more likely to suffer from exposure to particulate matter, smog, mercury, and other harmful emissions due to close siting to coal-fired power plants. Also, according to the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, low-income households and households of color face a much higher energy burden, or the percentage of household income that goes to electricity, to heating and cooling, and transportation. Low-income households spend roughly three times the percentage that higher-income households do on energy bills, due in part to a lack of access to energy efficiency programs and products. Additionally, Though black and Latino communities are statistically more concerned about climate issues, they're typically underrepresented in the efforts to solve them due to a lack of access of opportunity and the very environmental damages they face. But on the bright side, sustainable development offers an opportunity to ameliorate the environmental injustices faced by communities of color while increasing economic security and opportunity. Clean technologies are helping alleviate pollution in underserved communities, Green jobs are among the fastest growing in the country, and local projects ranging from renewables deployment to recycling infrastructure improvement provide new sources of economic input and output that the underserved can benefit from. So on today's session, we'll examine how these sustainability efforts can serve as just one of the many, many important pathways to equity and how we might better incorporate communities of color in those efforts. Specifically, I have a terrific set of experts joining me today to discuss the particular environmental challenges that they face, effective strategies to overcome these challenges and provide economic opportunity and security. Those will be highlighted by the specific approaches of our panelists in the areas of energy, technology, urban design and architecture, youth development and workforce readiness, among other things. And finally, we'll look at an outlook moving forward and how we might build on these existing efforts to accelerate true progress. So please um, allow me to introduce our panelists. We have Aaron Burnt, Head of Energy Industry Partnerships at Google. We have Mary Kate Morley Ryan, a Principal Director for Accenture and a lead on their Future Workforce Program. And we have Gina Chopala, who wears many hats. She's the President and Principal Consultant of Chopala and Associates, co-founder of Black Space Oklahoma, and affiliate faculty at the University of Oklahoma Gibbs College of Architecture. And they'll tell you a bit more about what they do in just a moment here. A few housekeeping notes. We invite everyone to submit questions via the chat box function. This conversation is being recorded and participants are in listen only mode. I'll field those questions and the rest of my team will as they pertain to the discussion in the last segment of today's program. So as questions come to you, please do feel free to submit them to the chat box function. And we received some in the registration portal too, so thank you for those. So without further ado, let's frame the opening question. I'd love to hear from each of our panelists. What is your role? And where in the environmental justice ecosystem do you sit? How does this role inform your opinion on the opportunity that sustainability efforts present for helping disadvantaged communities overcome these systemic hurdles. And I think we can start with, how about Aaron? Sure, sure, happy to, happy to go first. So we focus on the energy savings capabilities of our thermostats to help 
relieve the low income energy burden. So for, for our team in particular, we really help with partnerships to help increase the accessibility of our products and services to low income and disadvantages, disadvantaged communities um, to those who may not be able to afford them. So really, you know, taking up taking the product capabilities of energy savings and sustainability um, and helping drive those to to make those price points more accessible. Um, and the sustainability and energy savings has really been kind of a key factor for the company since the get go. Um, you know, back when Nest was launched, um, the energy, the founders knew that the capabilities of the thermostat to drive energy savings, um, which is the key kind of fundamental core principle of the company. And as we've continued to scale and grow the company, ensuring that those energy savings can be accessible to all has been an important uh, factor to us. So the overarching mission has been to create a home that takes care of the people inside it and the world around it. And our specific team works directly with uh, partners and energy utilities around their rebate programs, but also their low to moderate income uh, programs to help install energy savings devices in their homes, both to relieve, to drive energy savings and sustainability, but also obviously to help reduce their total energy bill. Um, and so we partner directly with those entities and program implementers to really help kind of open up those opportunities for, for customers to access those energy savings um, capabilities. And then we'll be able to touch on this more today, but we have kind of several key initiatives that we focus on to really specifically hone in on uh, low to moderate income programs. That's great. Thanks, Aaron. Gina, would you like to go next? Oh, so I I uh, wear multiple hats, as uh, Peter had indicated before. I'm the uh, president and principal consultant of Shofa and Associates, which is a project management and consulting firm. And we've been around for um, essentially about 20 years, small firm that really seeks out opportunities uh, more recently. Uh, Done to really seek out opportunities in the transportation area uh, and in the environmental um, space. Uh, I went, I, my background was in engineering, um, which is where I got my undergraduate degree, and then later in life uh, decided that uh, to expand those op opportunities uh, because of my interest in the transportation arena. I went back to school and um, to get a uh, uh, degree in uh, uh, city and uh, urban planning. And so um, we we often uh, ironically seem to be doing a lot of work outside of the spaces that we were really originally interested in, but wherever possible, we um, uh, just seek to be leaders, uh, thought leaders, and seek to be uh, uh, offer leadership and consulting in the areas of um, environmental justice and um, um, just really trying to execute and be proactive when it comes to small activities that our clients can initiate when it comes to the environmental space. And then a few years ago, 2017, a colleague of mine uh, who I did meet in planning school uh, invited me to go to Harvard's uh, uh, graduate school of design to a program or a, a, a symposium called black in design and we were fortunate enough to hear um, a group of young professionals out of New York called black space New York City that had formed a collective uh, where they supported each other they were a group of planners and architects and art artists and just others who were um, in the civic arena and specifically around the built environment. And so we uh, came back to Oklahoma after the, after having that experience. I was very interested in starting a nonprofit here. I was interested in it because of the work that I was already doing in the development and land use arena here in Oklahoma City. And so um, we decided to form Black Space Oklahoma really around the idea of connecting African-American communities. We have a 
really very, very rich African-American history throughout the state of Oklahoma. And so we saw that there was a need to uh, connect our community to resources and build capacity and help them um, understand the processes, uh, the, the resources that were available to them and bring them in exposure to professionals as well as academia so that uh, they would be empowered to come to the table to actually be engaged uh, in planning efforts and be part of uh, the solution making process especially when it deals with solutions that are affecting them specifically and then as affiliate faculty one of uh, will affiliate faculty at OU OU was my alma mater when it came to planning and one of our goals in forming Black Space actually was because we, we felt that um, we needed to be looking at this multi-generationally. And so it was important to build or broaden the pipeline to the profession of planning and to the profession of architecture and engineering and environmentalist and all of those uh, professions that have uh, some input or some say into what our built environment looks like. And so um, uh, I was asked and became a, uh, an affiliate faculty so that I could uh, partner with the university and bring that voice, that academic voice, the, the voice of research uh, and bring those resources to our community could connect them uh, and have so that they would have another avenue of of education, et cetera. You want to go ahead next, Mary Kate? Thanks, Gina. Yeah, for sure. Um, so Gina's story really resonates with me. Um, so in my work at Accenture, which is really focused on shaping the future of work, I do a lot around um, you know, how can we design for equity when it comes to workforce development and those pathways to future work, um, as well as overall economic inclusion. And then I'm responsible for some of Accenture's sustainability efforts within the US. Um, and uh, in that role, I work with both our community partners and nonprofits, um, as well as our clients, and then government entities around um, how can we really shape the future of work in an equitable way. Um, and to Gina's um, points around, you know, how do we design pathways um, and how do we make sure that we're looking across the ecosystem? Um, so one example of that um, is some of the work that we've done with Grid Alternatives and building um, and really uh, being aggressive around how we can build pathways for um, non-white people into those professions, frankly, um, and using both some of our cash grants as well as pro bono consulting to really drive more of an ecosystem approach to make that happen over time. So it's not sort of a, a flash in the pan, but it's we're building something that's sustainable sustainable in sustainability. Um, so yeah, those are just some of the examples. Um, and I'm sure as we kind of go along, I'll, I'll share some other highlights, but yeah. Certainly. Thanks so much, guys. Um, with that, I want to jump into defining the challenge um, a bit more that we face. So at the top of the discussion, I enumerated some statistics and broad trends in this space. But are there any real world examples of environmental justice or additions to the definition that we've laid out that we should highlight to illustrate what this sort of looks like on the ground and potentially identify some, some key targets? I can start. I think, you know, COVID is a, sort of a, a perfect example. I, I mean, from an Accenture perspective and, and my personal perspective, this, you know, racial injustice and health outcomes, as well as, you know, the environment are all kind of intertwined, right? And when we see sort of the, the rates that black people are dying when it, and being affect, infected um, by COVID or affected by COVID is at a much higher rate. Um, and Accenture has done a, a deep analysis of the jobs that have more of a COVID vulnerability um, and not surprising, unfortunately, um, most of those jobs are held by Hispanic and um, black um, folks, right? Workers who are, um, you know, in more uh, high exposure jobs. And I think, you know, to me, that's sort of the most recent world example. I think you highlighted some at the beginning, Peter, around sort of water 
um, also, you know, flooding, flood zones and, and, and things like that. Um, I'm sure Gina and Aaron have some other thoughts there, but uh, th that's just sort of a mo the most recent one, um, at least from my perspective when it comes to uh, COVID. Great. Thanks, Mary-Kate. I think that's an astute observation. Um, and, and from the from the world that that I work in with with the team, it's which is demand side management programs. And so for for those who don't know, uh, and, and being a call on sustainability, I'm, I'm sure that is the case. But just in case it didn't, like a lot of states have mandated energy efficiency targets, renewable targets, all that kind of stuff. And so they have large and run large programs um, within the state to help achieve those targets and there'll be a portfolio of programs ranging from commercial and industrial all the way down to residential programs. Um, gaps that we definitely see uh, in our work, it really range around uh, the low to moderate income program. Um, some states invest heavily in that space and really help, help that customer segment out. Um, Others will do uh, very little or like essentially essentially nothing or like just leveraging the small federal federal weatherization program dollars, which is nothing against those programs when you but when you balance that against the full kind of billion dollar portfolios that are going into the rest of the programs, it just seems seems out of whack, particularly since all customers are paying typically paying into those uh, to fund those programs. So from our from our perspective, that seems to be a an imbalance, and we we're always kind of looking for ways that we can help amplify uh, those programs in the portfolio. That's great. Thanks, Aaron. Gina, anything to add? No, I mean uh, I I think Mary Kate and Aaron have spoke really eloquently about some of the bigger problems. I mean, in my work, I sort of um, a lot of what I see real life is not just environmental, it really spans the spectrum of, you know, the built environment. Um, and, and, and so uh, environmental issues, ha environmental hazards, um, and, and, and the effects of that in our community really only play out as one component of some, some of the challenges that we face. But I mean, just to speak, I mean, we, we, we see, you know, problems as, close to a family as household hazards, you know, um, and the effect that it has. I mean, you spoke earlier about the rates of asthma uh, being higher in African-American communities and um, heart disease and even cancer rates are higher in African-American communities because some of the, the facilities that emit the type of pollution, uh, the tar type of particles uh, that uh, are emitted in our communities are are located right there. And while yes, our community sort of intuitively knows uh, that these hazards exist and that they shouldn't be there, they they do not often uh, have um, the wherewithal, whether it be financial wherewithal, they, they may not feel empowered uh, or tooled with what they need to be able to sit at the table and tell their story to power. Uh, they may be feel disenfranchised because of broken promises in the past, and so they don't feel like their voice is, is really heard. And then even when we do have voices that uh, articulate uh, enough and or uh, understand that their voice that their voice means something, you know, the hurdles and the barriers that they have to go through to try and get justice uh, or to remove um, um, or come against a large corporation becomes really daunting. And so, again, we sort of settle in this um, world or in this environment uh, that is impacted by pollutants and, and, and hazards. And so it, it, it feels very futile in terms of, of um, a way out, trying to find a way out. Well, thank you all for, for painting that picture. And I think, Gina, what you just were touching on leads leads really nicely into the next section. We want to get to the kind of opportunity here and the solutions to these challenges and tactics behind them, specifically highlighted by your all's work. So I'll jump into that line of questioning and starting with Aaron, 
given your perch, could you could you paint us a, a picture of what a, a just energy system looks like and kind of speak to the importance of building one as it relates to both protecting these over polluted communities and, and also providing kind of economic security and opportunity? And what are some of the specific projects that Google is undertaking in this realm. Yeah. So so as I as I mentioned a, a key focus area for us is just helping ensure that the programs that are out there and available and are running in market are being open and able and eligible to low to moderate income and disadvantaged communities. So it's really just ensuring that that equity across their portfolio and one of the key ways that Nest and Google have invested to really help drive that narrative uh, is through a key project that we launched in 2018 called the Nest Power Project. And that was uh, right after, right ish, after we had launched our lower priced uh, Nest Thermostat E. Um, and when we, when we launched that thermostat, uh, which is at a significantly reduced price as our premium model, a key goal was to increase accessibility of our products um, and at the same time our team had already been working with you know dozens and dozens of utility programs across the country on helping kind of what are the key barriers to unlocking um, kind of the next generation of technology energy savings technology into those programs and when when we were looking at some of the data you'd already mentioned a lot of the a lot of the key statistics of you know there's 35 million low-income households in America and those families spend three times as much on of their income on energy and being a company that wants to help drive energy savings and has energy savings products that we feel can really help enable that within our customers um, we we wanted to help uh, on that front uh, the other the other aspect that we looked at is one in four americans are eligible for home energy assistance based on income but nowhere near that many kind of get that assistance and help within their, with kind of upgrade their homes to reduce their energy usage. So when we launched the Nest Power Project, um, we really set ourselves a target to get a million thermostat ease through low to moderate income partner programs. Um, and from our perspective, it's essentially at cost. Um, <clears throat> and those are usually provided in the form of a direct installation program, so you know, at no cost to customers, um, whether it's through a weatherization program or a utilities low to moderate income program or a moderate income program. Um, but we really work with the partner network to help ensure that they can access our devices to help accelerate uh, those those key goals, really all around accessibility, and then that that overarching narrative of you know helping all customers save energy, not just those that can afford it. That's great. Thanks, Aaron. And it's comforting to know that these solutions and products are are out there and it's a mean of it's a means of um, just expanding access. In many cases, we have sort of these solutions at hand. Um, I did want to jump to Gina. Similarly, as, as an engineer and urban planner by trade, could you speak to the importance of ensuring equity in the in the built environment and things like the transportation system? What what are your organizations doing to advance this? So you know, I think um, you know we we sort of as a society and as individuals we take the built environment for granted in terms of its impact, but it really does impact everything we do. It impacts all aspects of our lives from our uh, sense of well-being to our um, uh, health outcomes, you know, our sense of safety. Um, it, it impacts uh, transportation systems, obviously, impact our mobility, our accessibility to uh, to jobs, to education. So, I mean, every day we're walking and living in our spaces. Um, our, our quality of life is being impacted by the built environment. You know, it also, though, I think reinforces who we think we are. Um, subconsciously, uh, we take in the contributions, the successes, or the, the non-successes, if you will, the failures of our society or our, or our history from our environment. Um, the environment offers tangible 
evidence of our history. It gives us something to touch when we talk about, um, um, say for instance, and, and I'm speaking primarily from the standpoint of an African-American community where we've seen so many communities across the country that really uh, have been decimated. And so they don't have tangible assets any longer to really connect to and reinforce the stories of their forefathers or their ancestors to say, you know, yeah, we did this, we contributed to this, we built this church, we, we, we had a say in how this area was developed. And so those, those um, uh, pictures are often gone. And so when you don't have that tangible evidence, it, it then uh, sort of speaks to who you think you are, um, who you, uh, re whether it reinforces your security or your insecurities. And then it, it also tells others how to feel about you. And so I think um, when you don't have equitable, equitable, practices or equitable communities or equity in uh, how you roll out a transportation system. You're communicating to a segment of society that they're not important. And um, you're communicating that whenever we have environmental issues that go unaddressed, you are perpetuating this idea, not just to the generation that's living there now, but really for generations to come. You're impacting people generationally and telling them that they're either significant or they're not significant. And so we, um, uh, with Black Space Oklahoma, we really uh, have made sure that we uh, go after projects that offer us the ability to uh, partner and bring connections to community through advocacy, through uh, education, through consultancy, and then really to through you know bringing again connections to uh, resources and whether those resources be human resources, financial resources, or other type of resources to help uh, build leadership and capacity within the community. Um, uh, when I talk about Chauvelin Associates, for instance, again, we really seek opportunities in, um, to be on development teams, to be involved in the design or implementation of uh, transportation systems that are being rolled out. But that might also include um, environmental assessments. It might include environmental impact statements as it relates to uh, uh, any type of, of uh, federal project where we're looking at public lands be, being uh, uh, redeveloped or, or uh, realignments of, of roads or anything like that. But it also, I mean, more recently and really more at home in terms of what we really do. Um, in Oklahoma City, for instance, I work as a developer's rep and I work, I've worked for several years with a developer in redeveloping a, a, an area of town, really rebuilding the neighborhood that was once decimated and, and felt the effects of an urban renewal policies of the 70s. And so, um, you know, doing small things like convincing, again, that it's important to look at um, size of our trees or the, the, the value of, a mature tree that has been allowed to grow in uh, what was decimated and vacant land is as important to um, to keep rather than to cut it down and in in our development practices just to cut it down and uh, plant new and so you know it again we try to inspire leadership in just small acts of of in my environmental practices and, and being good stewards of the land. Thanks, Gina. And it's comforting to know that that is kind of a bedrock of your approach across the nonprofit and also your consultancy, that those justice issues can be part of the, that core kind of material business there. Um, so thank you for that. This is for Mary-Kate and Gina, um, due to the overlap of your 
programs where they focus heavily on building up the actual capacities and confidence of, of people in these communities in order to both combat systemic disadvantages and also equip them, whether it's job seekers or youths themselves, with tools to adapt to a changing and, and greening economy. So could you guys please touch on each of your unique approaches to that and, and why the cultivation of individuals specifically is, is so important? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, from an Accenture perspective, we sort of frame this within where we see the future of work going um, and, and kind of more broadly, I guess, from both a global perspective and then if we sort of zero in on the U.S. and then specific cities. But, you know, we see a lot of disruption. and I think we've all seen a lot of disruption with COVID and sort of that sort of accelerating. Um, and when we sort of look at, you know, how we need to redefine diversity and inclusion and those words um, and more focus on equity and what I would call resiliency when it comes to talent um, and people as individuals. Um, you know, I think there's there's a lot there when it comes to um, from a data perspective and from a community perspective and then sort of this N of one. Um, and I guess, you know, sort of stepping back a little bit, you know, we see a lot of impacts from looking at the future of work just more broadly when we think about that as a key component of the sort of quote unquote environment, if you will, and what people do every day. You know, a lot of folks who are in lower complexity jobs um, who are non-degreed over the age of 25 um, are primarily people of color and they're going to be more impacted, like I've already said, by COVID or, um, you know, whether it's a family member or themselves. And then also Gina mentioned sort of the other sort of factors, whether it's sort of housing um, security, food security, th things like that, and even just transportation. Um, so I think, you know, we really look at it as, okay, what, how can we support that group of people? Um, and how can we provide opportunities and accessibility um, and be really creative around that? Um, so one of the things that we've noticed um, as we've gone and sort of done what I would call more place-based engagements um, when it comes to driving an inclusive future of work is, you know, looking at the transportation. So we partnered with Lyft and did the pi pilot program that's now gone nationally because, you know, what we saw in St. Louis is people couldn't freaking get to work. Right. And you're sitting there going, you have a job, we have a job, we have this incredible training, we have we have these opportunities. And basically around, you know, the county of St. Louis, it's a complete transportation desert from a public perspective. You know, our Metrolink doesn't move, um, doesn't go out there. And, um, and that's St. Louis. And then we looked across the country and saw that that is not a, um, <laughs> that is not a anomaly, if you will. Um, that is all, all over the place, even in large cities like D.C., right, where there is a lot of public, perceived public transportation. There are pockets where people can't get to work or get to training. Um, so we've been really aggressive around um, pulling in our other um, sort of employers in this space, um, figuring out unique ways to work with nonprofits. And then also from a government, um, you know, sort of public sector perspective, how can we collaborate um, to drive more inclusion? Um, and then as we go along, making sure that we're informing that by the people on the ground versus sort of this macro level view of, of okay, what's happening from an economics perspective or what's happening in this overall industry, which is important, um, but it doesn't take into, effect, into account the fact that, you know, what's the day in the life of someone, you know, who is sitting next to a factory or is concerned about the water that they're drinking or is concerned about lead poisoning for their child because they're in an extremely old building, but it's really cheap and it's allowing them to do all these other things and, and sort of what are the trade-offs that they make every day. Um, so we, you know, in some of the work that we do, we, we do a lot of ethnographic research where we sit down and we talk to workers and we do interviews and we do focus groups. Um, and we, we've done day in the lives, right, to help educate sort of a farther, um, sort of our broader group of partners. So that as we design, we're co-designing with, with, with the workers, with the people who are experiencing um, challenges versus from a, um, you know, what I would call somewhat disconnected view of, oh, this, if we just sort of provide support from a training perspective, or if we just provide transportation, they, you know, these folks will be okay, or they'll be able to, you know, participate and, and be included. Um, so I would say, you know, clearly very passionate about this space, but um, 
you know, those are a few examples that I think um, are relevant um, and sort of play off of what I've heard from Aaron and Gina. So um, uh, I actually was going to give you an example. I still want to talk about this example, um, uh, which really how we were sort of introduced, Peter, and that was with um, uh, a project that we're rolling out uh, that's being um, funded by um, Region 6 EPA's uh, Environmental Justice Grant. But I just thought of an example, actually, that um, that I think is, uh, when you talk about unique approaches, is one of the approaches that, you know, I've used in the past and some of my colleagues and especially um, co-founder uh, of Black Space Oklahoma and then some of my uh, academic um, uh, colleagues, and that's this uh, tool called Photo Voice. We did a project a few years ago uh, where, uh, and we've uh, since had um, 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 articles written about that particular project, project and the results of it, but we worked with uh, community women. Um, there was a case here in Oklahoma City that um, involved a police officer who, who was actually uh, targeting women in the African-American community and committing these really horrendous rapes. <clears throat> and uh, that was sort of the backdrop of this project. And, and from my perspective, it was, you know, it, it does the built, built environment um, to help to foster uh, crime and help to, to, to facilitate really uh, some of these uh, atrocious activities or things that seem to happen in our communities and and does the environment itself whether it's is it, is it the, the lack of safety uh help to promote that and so we uh, recruited um 26 women and worked with them to uh, photograph their environment with some very uh, targeted questions about life-giving spaces and non-life-giving spaces. And so what that did is it gave them the opportunity to actually, one, learn a skill set, learn uh, a unique uh, methodology, uh, who's really a qualitative research methodology of capturing um, things that concern them in their community and being able to then put words to those images. And this was all for the purpose of telling truth to power. And it was very interesting that many of those women identified environmental hazards in their midst. And then they were able to come together collaboratively and identify the most important challenges that they were that that they were facing and how they communicated them and how they wanted to communicate them and 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 titled them and then put their narratives to that and then we held an exhibit where we invited power we invited uh you know the mayor we invited the police chief you know we invited uh city council members as, and and a whole slew of of of, of um uh, political and uh, professional leaders who who were uh, leading efforts in the spaces that these women identified. And mm -hmm. from my perspective, the backdrop was how do we, how do what what will it take to activate change in our communities? We we understand some of the processes, some of the dynamics of what has to happen, but there are other things that motivate people towards change. And if safety was a was a motivator for policymakers, then let's talk about this and come at it from a perspective of safety. And so that was a really effective um, engagement methodology because we absolutely saw uh, uh, change. Some of that change may have already been in the work, but I think that the, the exhibit that actually went around the state and even into other states uh, won an award and really empowered these women to not just engage in that one activity, but many of them have stayed engaged. They've been co-authors of, of the, um, the literature have, that has been uh, published and the academic literature that's been published behind it. And they have gone on to continue being involved in their community and involved in, a civic, in, in civic engagement. And so it was a real success in showing how to build leaders, giving them the tools to engage in this particular activity 
but then continuing taking ownership and saying we're going to continue. But I did want to, the example that I was going to use was the EPA grant. And so we, um, uh, it's a project that we're working on now and we're looking, we're using household hazards as a topic really to educate and develop youth leaders, you know, by giving them an opportunity to take this problem and uh, develop solutions, uh, engage with the community. Um, they, the goal is to reach 500 households where they really are the thought leaders and they have an opportunity to also engage with environmental professionals who will train them and teach them about household hazards, but uh, also we have the opportunity to bring in other environmental issues. Um, the, the specific focus again is on education and I just wanna give a shout out to the colleagues that we're working with. Again, we mm -hmm. seek to collaborate so we, um, uh, we have a dynamic um, duo, uh, mother-daughter duo. The mother is a former DEQ, which is Department of Environment and Quality here in Oklahoma. She was the uh, head of pollution prevention. So she and her daughter, who was an environmental attorney and who actually was the one who wrote the grant, Peter, that uh, EPA turned you on to, told you about us, um, they uh, will be bringing, uh, uh, writing a curriculum mm -hmm bringing other DEQ professionals who will, will uh, roll out sort of this general information that we can then take and roll it out to multi-ages or children, youth of multiple ages, because what we're hoping is, what we're believing is that leadership comes in all forms and it comes in multiple ages. And then we're partnering with a, um, an organization called I Have a Voice Now, who's led by a woman named Ayana Najuma, who is a former uh, civil rights activist when she was a child. And so our passion is really to work with very young children to help empower them and equip them with the tools so that they can uh, utilize their voice in uh, expressing their concerns and talking about the things that they are passionate about. So she'll be working with those smaller, you know, uh, age children in, in rolling out these environmental issues and how to develop solutions, how, how do we critically think about these solutions, and then putting together um, uh, a plan where they will have the opportunity to then come back and present to professionals and uh, um, what their solutions are. We're working with the local church to, to, for the older older children, uh, Mount Triumph, and then we're working with an actual neighborhood within our community that has been very active and who uh, have been experiencing uh, major environmental hazard impacts. Um, they are not far from a automobile salvage yard that sets off explosions every night. They have been extremely active in their pursuit for justice, working with city council, working with DEQ, working with multiple agencies, as well as engaging with the business itself to try and find solutions and to no avail. And so this is an opportunity to actually work with them, understand uh, policies, educate them on what what uh, laws are available to them and, and maybe come up with solutions and use, again, youth to help develop some of the solutions that uh, these adults might be able to actually employ. So it's a it's a, an exciting process, an exciting project that will kind of help um, our community members make connections, uh, how the environment in connect to their everyday life. And so once they make those connections, you find that uh, people are more interested in taking uh, action. You know, once they understand how it affects uh, my day-to-day -day living, then activism and action is actually birthed out of that. So, um, yeah, so, you know, we, we're excited about the capacity building, the leadership building, we're excited about um, the fact that they'll have an opportunity, kids will have an opportunity to do critical thinking, they'll have an opportunity to engage with professionals, and just all of these things are kind of tied into the type of projects that we do, and that being an example of one that really is targeted to um, uh, looking at the environment and its impact on our community specifically. 
certainly. Yeah. Thank you for that. And all of what you have all have been speaking to highlights some of the other things we were planning on mentioning, like the importance of collaboration. I think that that's evident in all of your programs, whether it's Mary Kate's with their partner work with Lyft and trying to influence their other partners, Aaron's with the utilities they work with, um, and Gina you know, with you, the DEQ um, in Oklahoma and the other local partners that you mentioned. Um, I want to move on to the next question. I, I, we're going to kill two birds with one stone here and answer an audience question as well. Um, so both Aaron and Mary Kate, both of your initiatives focus or rely heavily on technology to accomplish your respective goals. So could you speak to the role that tech can play in these efforts and what Google and Accenture are doing to leverage their core competencies there? And the audience question, that we, we have a number coming in that I'm consolidating, but essentially with this new digitally focused world in the midst of the pandemic, how is that changing tactics? How can we um, better adapt to this new reality? So maybe it's both a, a hardware and a software uh, hmm. question, but I'll throw that over to you too. Uh, sure. So I've talked about kind of how we leverage programs to, to increase the accessibility of our, of our programs, but for sustainability and tech overall, a lot of our product-related focus and really a key thing that we're looking to enable beyond just energy efficiency savings is really the grid impacts that smart thermostats as a category can have on grid flexibility. So with the increasing adoption of renewable energy, uh, you know, really all across the country, you know, Google is a, is a very aggressive on that front, you know, and as are many other corporates across the country. Um, that's driving the need to really come up with technologies that can that can kind of help balance the the inherent kind of more nuanced way that the solar and wind provide energy to the grid, which is more uh, fluctuating. So a key thing that we focus on is called demand response, where our thermostats can be in partnership with utility programs and, and their partners dispatched to help essentially reduce system load during key grid constrained time periods. And so that's that's one example where we have a lot of programs in market, I think dozens really across the country through, through multiple different partners um, that help kind of shape and leverage technology in customers' homes. And when I was talking about ensuring that customers of all classes have access to those capabilities, it's really kind of painting the picture for customers having access to those capabilities really for the new energy future. So a lot of a lot of low to moderate income programs have essentially been the same for like a decade, meaning installing the same measures, uh, not upgrading to kind of the latest to really help enable those customers for the for the clean energy future. Um, and that's a, a key element where we're focused on both to drive energy efficiency from a base load reduction, but providing uh, thermostats that can help, you know, easily help a customer easily adjust during a time of use rate that might be coming down um, from their utility in the future, but also so that they can participate in the utilities demand response programs as well, which typically also pay the customer to participate in. So not only does it drive their bill down, but they can earn money from the utility by being a part of this program to have, that will help further drive kind of the increase of penetration of renewables. So that's that's a key aspect of just where we see there's a ton of value um, really for all involved um, on that front and, and a key area of focus for us uh, going forward for sure. And yeah, and from an Accenture perspective, there's probably sort of three or four key areas that I would highlight. So um, just like Google, right, we have our own sort of footprint that we need to be um, caring for and thinking about at a global level. And so we're a part of, you know, things with the United Nations Global Compact around, you know, the sustainability goals and, and what we can be doing with our own people um, and our own sort of, uh, you know, footprint, if you will. Um, 
you know, and at the same time, we're also, you know, encouraging and working with other large corporations to, to think about think about their footprint so that we can do this together um, with a particular focus on technology. Um, so that's kind of one kind of bucket, I, I would say. Uh, another bucket is really looking at um, what it, when it comes to the work that we do with our clients. Um, so ensuring that as we're designing technologies and as we're designing solutions or co-designing them with our clients, that one, just like Gina's talked about before, we're including all voices in that design. Um, and that from a, whether it's an uh, extended reality or a virtual reality or um, whether it's a res you know, an AI tool, right, that we're doing that responsibly. Um, and that we're, in, we're again including the voices that need that are part of um, that need to be included as a part of that design, and that we're looking at both the what I would call the shareholder impact, but frankly more broadly the stakeholder impact. Um, so the community impact of what what's being developed um, from a sort of a community perspective and sort of workforce perspective. You know some of the some of the highlights I would I would sort of call out are one really leveraging artificial intelligence to design for equity and inclusion, um, and also sort of radical access. Um, so an example of that would be um, really looking at skills based hiring um, versus focusing on um, maybe degree requirements or certification requirements, and really driving that conversation. Um, so we've started with research, you know, several years ago with Harvard around dismissed by degrees and really continued to, to push in that area, both with internally where we've opened up completely new levels within Accenture to drive work based learning um, alternative um, sort of pathways into Accenture that are for non degreed folks. Um, as well as you know, leveraging artificial intelligence to really grab skills of, of folks and help them understand what their skills are. Because I think, again, some of the work that I've heard, Gina, that you're leading, you know, it's really around this self-efficacy or, or confidence, right, that people have and, and helping them know that they have some of these skills and they have a significant amount of um, value to add to the conversation based on their lived experience, but frankly, on their cognitive ability and, their, and all kinds of other stuff that they may be underestimating. And so, you know, that's a that's a really key focus. We have some research efforts in that space as well on how we can drive that more systemically in the work that we do um, from a uh, what I would call more of the um, the, the hard side of things. Um, we're doing things with uh, like uh, coral and, you know, auto imaging and automating image tagging and things like that to track with the coral, what's going on with the coral reefs. Um, we're doing a lot around sort of um, predictive water maintenance and making sure that you know, leveraging IoT and machine learning to look at sort of what's happening with water um, globally. Um, and then I think sort of the third area that I wanna highlight is, um, you know, we have about half a million people at Accenture um, and that's that's a large workforce. And so when, when we can mobilize that workforce around a particular topic or a particular issue or, or drive awareness or education, it can really drive global change. So some of the things that we are really in, invested in is really around social innovation. So how can we tap into our people and our communities and provide avenues for them to provide their, you know, you know, world changing and, um, you know, joyful and hard at times sort of ideas um, in this space um, to create that excitement and to create that impact um, from the people that, again, it's, it may be more impacting for them or that they're more passionate about. So we do a lot around employee engagement. Um, in this space, as well as um, learning. So all kinds of just eco learning boards um, and volunteer volunteer things around greener than game and all kinds of stuff in this space to really drive awareness um, and commitment. And so, yes, there's a, a bunch of technology in, in that space. And I think particularly with artificial intelligence, particularly with um, machine learning, we're also seeing some really incredible things um, leveraging virtual reality where giving people the experience of, of both, uh, as I think Gina said, sort of the, um, you know, maybe the less safe environments, right? And also the safer environments. And what is that like, um, it, whether you're in those all the time or not, to help people understand where others might be coming from, and then also to get excited about taking care of our earth. So I think, you know, it's kind of goes both ways. Um, but th those are kind of three areas. It's terrific. Thank you, guys. And I think what what else has been enumerated is just a, a number of resources that you all have come into contact with, either within or outside of your own organization. And I did just want to circle back to that because it's 
in an audience question as well. We have kind of naturally flowed into the, the Q&A that I've been seeing in the chat box. So thank you audience members for your participation. Are there any other re key kind of key resources out there that corporations can, can use to drive environmental justice initiatives, both on the front lines and behind closed doors? Um, are there, and maybe with a special focus to companies that are just kind of taking their first step there, where should they start? I can go first here. Um, so I, I would say it's about getting to work. I, I mean, I think we've studied a lot of things. I think it's, you know, research is important. Studying things is important, using data to inform. But I think, you know, the way that we talk about it is we need to have a bias for action with the data or the research that we have. And I think, you know, the more that I think we can look at how we can act in this space, as well as incenting social innovation in the space by people of color. So those would kind of be my two things, have a bias for action and really incent social innovation that's led by people of color versus sort of um, their sort of opinion is asked for, you know, halfway through or something. Um, yeah, those would be my two thoughts. That's great. Aaron or Gina, you want to go quickly? Aaron. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm super qualified to answer that question other, other than like if you're, if it, uh, a lot of where we focus, our team specifically focuses on is, is really in the regulatory process for all the utility programs. And so that that can and really can be translated to policy decisions and just being actively engaged in those to help drive that action that Mary Kate's talking about. Because that if you don't, if you're not engaged at that level um, to drive that, that big change, like it can easily go in a, in a wildly different direction than a helpful one. So that's that's where we spend a lot of time as well. Thanks, Aaron. Gina, anything to add, anything to add there? No, I'm not as familiar with some of the technologies that a company or a large corporation can, can use to drive it. I think, um, you know, obviously technology is important and it's important. I think they have, they have a uh, tremendous opportunity to actually, actually utilize, um, uh, the, I have this saying kind of money walks and talks, right? <laughs> and, and prestige goes a long way in leveraging um, what happens or their ability to leverage change within a community. Uh, again, I, I sort of reiterate what Mayor Kate and Aaron uh, have already uh, communicated that the engagement and getting people's voices at the table in the beginning, being part of the solution or, or developing those solutions is So, I think another uh, another resource you addressed was the EPA grant program, which is another um, important one. They do ha indeed have an environmental justice program, which is not um, completely well known. So it's it's important to keep eyes open for these additional resources out there um, and continue thinking of ways to collaborate with people in your value chain, as we touched on. Um, and I mean, if you talk about those kind of academic resources too, I mean, you know, a lot of resources that are, I think a lot of businesses often overlook are the universities that are right in their midst. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of research that goes on, there's a tremendous amount of innovation in these areas. And so, um, and often, um, academia, I mean, this can be such a great partner in sort of bringing the data and bringing uh, new methodologies because they're on the cutting edge and often doing things long before um, uh, corporations have an opportunity to see it. And so partnering with uh, universities in, and, and even partnering with lower you know, secondary education and adopting schools is a great opportunity for uh, companies to uh, begin to have an impact on molding these uh, environmental leaders at a very early age. Certainly. It's well said. Academic in institutions can certainly be a great ally. Well, we are at time now. Um, we could speak about these topics for hours and hours, and we have a lot more to get to, but unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I want to thank you all for joining today's call, and thanks especially to our speakers for their time today. 
this conversation is just the beginning of our of our work in this space so we, we sincerely hope you'll stay tuned and continue learning alongside everyone here and ourselves and and embarking on projects that can truly help move the needle here which we'll continue to discuss so um, if your question was not answered i believe we consolidated and got to all of them but if it was not answered or if you have additional questions or any ideas arise after today's call um, please feel free to reach us at our, our general line for the Corporate Citizenship Center at the Chamber Foundation. You'll see that in the follow-up email or myself at pfadul, which is F-A-D-O-U-L, at uschamber.com. Um, and finally, please don't hesitate to reach out to us for any help with support um, for your efforts in this realm or any other sustainability efforts. We, we want to um, continue being a facilitator of, of true progress here. So thanks again to everyone. Um, I hope you stay well and healthy and, and my best wishes for, for true progress to everyone here. All right, thank you so much and, and take care. <laughs> thanks.